Isaiah 7, Isaiah 9, Hebrews chapter 4. I want to begin a new series with you um, today through the month of December called God with Us. And what we're going to do is we're going to look at Isaiah 9, 6 specifically. There are four titles, four names for God, for Jesus that the prophet gave. And we're going to break down every one of those names as we, um, as we go through this study together. I want to set the background for you in Isaiah's day, okay? Isaiah was a prophet who was around uh, 740 B.C. So the year is about 740 B.C. In Judah, Israel was once a vibrant, zealous, godly nation. They were once a victorious nation, but things were really going under for the people of God. And the prophet Isaiah He had a really hard task, a difficult task of preaching truth to these people. And and the fact is they were in such sin, they were in such rebellion that he had to preach a message of judgment. He had to preach a message of chastisement. He had to preach a message of rebuke from the Lord because this is what had happened. Israel had rebelled. Judah had rebelled. Um, Israel had fallen. Judah had fallen. And so in Isaiah 1... The prophet Isaiah gives the description that Israel was like wandering or lost animals who didn't know who they belonged to. He said, he said in, in the first part of chapter 1, he said, an ox knows its owner, a donkey knows its master's crib, but Israel doesn't know. They don't even consider who they belong to. They have no regard. They have no repentance. They have no reverence towards the Lord. As a matter of fact, Isaiah went on in chapter 1, and he said in verse 4 that Israel was a sinful nation. They were a people laden with iniquity. They were a brood of evildoers. They were children of corruption. They were forsakers of God. They were provokers of his wrath. And he said, just to put it all together, he said Israel from head to toe was sick, spiritually sick. Isaiah chapter 5, God described Israel as a vineyard that he loved and he cared for and that he planted and he even tried to prune. But God expressed his disappointment because they produced no fruit. This is the time that Isaiah lived in in 740 B.C. Judah was in a lot of trouble. Israel had fallen. And so because they had been so rebellious and because they had been so sinful, they were going to be judged. They were actually going to be overtaken. They were going to be defeated. They were going to be conquered. As a matter of fact, they were going to be uh, exiled out out of their homeland for a period of about 70 years, all because they wanted to ally themselves with pagan and idolatrous cultures, pagan gods, pagan nations. And here's the thing. They wanted that. They wanted to rebel. They wanted to step away from God, and God was going to treat them as such. All right, Israel had fallen. But here's the beauty of Isaiah's message. Even though they had sinned, even though they had failed, even though they had wandered so far away from God, God was going to do something amazing. God was going to bring them hope. God was going to bring them restoration. God was going to bring them healing. God was going to bring the sinful people salvation. That's amazing, isn't it? Okay, that, that's grace. What an awesome God that we have. He said in Isaiah, though our sins were as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. How? How could this happen? Because God is good, isn't he? Because God is merciful, because God is love and grace. God would spare his sinful people. God would save his people. God would redeem his people. And you know what he would do. This is the beauty of the story of Christmas, but the beauty and story of salvation. God would come down. He would come down. God would be with us. Emmanuel, God with us. Us, how this message, I'm thinking about Isaiah's day and for his people who were really afar and away from him, how this message would have brought hope to them. You know, how it would have brought comfort to them and peace to the hearts of his people to hear that they hadn't been forgotten about, even though they had forgotten the Lord, to hear that they were not going to be forsaken, even though they had forsook the Lord, even then they'd heard to, that, that they would be forgiven of God. And yet they were to me and to you pretty unforgivable in the things that they had done. But God was going to send a gift, his son, God with us. God's what the world needed. Jesus is what the world needed. We did not deserve him. 
But God gave him. Why? Because we were broken, weren't we? Not just Judah, not just Israel, but the whole world. We were broken and needed a restoration. We were defeated. We were destitute and needed a rescuer. We were in darkness and we needed the light of the world to come. We were dirty and unblemished and covered in sin and we needed cleansing because we were dead in our trespasses and sin. God was going to bring us a Savior. God came to us to be our defender, to be our healer, our redeemer, our savior. That's the wonder of the plan of God. That's the wonder of the power of God. That's the wonder of the purpose of God, that God would come to us, hurting as we were, right? You've got to put yourself in Judah's shoes, Israel's shoes, hurting as they were, hurting as we were, hopeless as we were, as they were, helpless as we were, as they were. God came in the flesh loved us and pursued us and brought us salvation. I think, I think that needs to be said today to somebody, that God loves you. <laughs> Have you thought about that this morning? <laughs> That, that God loves you, that God has pursued you. Maybe you need to be reminded of that blessed thought today that, that you are worth his love, you are worth his pursuit, you are worth the fight and the battle that was waging. You are worth the very death of Christ. You are worth his coming to save. Otherwise, he wouldn't have done that. Okay, I think, I think many people, many nations, many cultures and circumstances that we find ourselves in need that hope spoken into their reality that God loves us so much that he came for us. That's how he sees us. That's, how, that's what he saw in Isaiah's day. Israel was so blind spiritually. They were so broken down spiritually. Israel was so much in sin and shame and greatly deserving. Here's the thing. They were greatly deserving of the wrath of God. They were greatly deserving of the judgment of God. Yet God came near to them. He said, I'm coming. I'm going to fix this problem. I'm coming. I desire to be near you. I desire to restore you. I desire to cleanse you and forgive you. I want to come down to you. Isn't that the very cry of our Lord some 2,700 years later? God is still saying, I'm coming down to you. I want to reach you. I want to meet you right where you are. I want to be with you. I want to heal and redeem and save whatever hopeless situation you're in. Whatever desperate situation you may find yourself, no matter how helpless you may feel, it took God being with us. And it still takes God being with us. Emmanuel is a very relevant subject today. That's God's desire to be with us. There were two men that were traveling on a plane together. One was a businessman and one was an older gentleman traveling home from a family visit. And the businessman had his laptop open and on his computer screen there was a picture of a sweet little boy. And the older gentleman, he didn't ask who he was. The businessman just said, I want to introduce you to my son. This is my little boy. This is my only child. And, and, and the picture uh, was taken just a few months ago, and the businessman just went on and on and talked about how great his son was. He had a lot of excitement in his voice about how much he meant to him, and he talked about his son's first steps. I mean, they're just flying on a plane here. He talks about his first steps. He talks about the first words that he said, the first day of school that he had, his first ball game. And then he showed the older man more pictures. He pulls out his wallet and says, why don't you take a look at these pictures of my son? And, and, then, and then he pulls out his phone, and he's got more pictures on his phone of his son. And then he pulls out a social media page, and he begins to show him even more pictures. And behind every picture, this man had a story about his son. And the older gentleman, he was getting, you know, kind of bored, to be honest, <laughs> kind of annoyed too, mainly because he wanted to sleep and get home. And to be honest, the pics to him, the, the pictures, they weren't that uh, extraordinary. I mean, they were pretty ordinary photos. And the businessman said, I can't wait to get home to him. But in the meantime, I'm just going to look at his picture. I'm just going to enjoy his picture and, and adore his picture. I could look at this picture all day. How about you, sir? <laughs> And the older man thought, why is he so preoccupied with his son? Was it because the boy's achievements were impressive? Because he's thinking, no, my, my own grandchildren are more impressive than this kid. I mean, my, my grandchildren are sweeter than they and cuter than his own. Of course, he didn't say that aloud, but that's what he's thinking. And the businessman, though, he was so excited about his child. Why was he so excited? Because he was looking at his child through the perspective, through the eyes, through the love of a father. Everything the boy did, 
he was amazed by. Everything the boy did, he was in wonder by, joyful about. It did not matter that other children could do the same thing as his son. The dad said with great pride on that plane, that's my boy. And the older man said, you obviously missed your son. How long has it been since you've been home? How long has it been since you saw your son? And the dad said, just yesterday. (laughs) One day from his son was too many days apart. He didn't just want to love his son from a distance. He wanted to be with his son. That's God's desire for you and for me. (laughs) That's what he desired for Israel many, many years ago. That's God's heart for us to give us Emmanuel, to be Emmanuel, God with us. That's why... In Isaiah chapter 7, when when the prophet gave this word, that's why these words were so profound. I know that you have read these verses over and over and over again. I know that you've heard them since maybe you were a child, but they're still so needed in our world today. Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14 says, Therefore the Lord shall give you a sign. You were in sin. You you were destitute. You were broken. You, You deserve judgment. But it says, Therefore the Lord shall give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. You know what Emmanuel means? God with what? Us. Man, that must have brought hope. It must have shook the the reality to the core that God still loved them and cared about them. And then in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, later on, the prophet says again, for unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given and the government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Here's what Isaiah was saying to the people in his day. God is coming down for his dearly loved children. And he's going to be the hope that you need. He's going to be the peace that you need. He's going to be the strength, the help, everything that you need. He's going to be the salvation that you need. God is with us. And that's what this sermon series is going to be about. The hope that's found in Jesus Christ with us. The joy that's found in being with with God, being with us. The the strength and peace and salvation of knowing that God is with us. And so I do hope and I do pray that as we draw close to the Lord that you will enjoy studying Isaiah 9, 6. That he indeed is our wonderful counselor, our mighty God, our everlasting father, our Prince of Peace. I want to I want to start today by talking about God being with us as our wonderful counselor. Now, you got to make a promise to me. I have way too much content for one sermon today. All right? And you're going to be glad of that. Amen. So this is what I want you to do. I'm going to share with you one way today that God is our wonderful counselor. If you'll make a promise to me that you'll come back tonight and hear the other two because God's going to blow your mind by what he says tonight just as he does this morning about him being our wonderful counselor. He certainly is wonderful, isn't he? All right. Uh, you, you know, in some translations, if you've got the King James like I do or the New King James like I do, um, the, in some translations, the titles are separate. There's a comma between wonderful and counselor. And, 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 and that's fine. You know, that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. I preached it that way before. I, I prefer them, though, to be together. I suppose um, that you could do that with all of them, actually. Okay, you could put a comma between every word. You could have eight different titles for Jesus Christ because he is a wonderful person. He is our counselor. He is mighty. He is God. He is everlasting. He is father. He is the prince, and he is peace. Okay, you you could do that. I just want you to know, though, that back in the Hebrews day when this this was written uh, or said, they didn't have punctuation marks, all right? So, so everything would have ran together. So I think that they should go together as wonderful counselor. I do believe that Jesus is wonderful in and of, of himself, don't you? I believe that. The most wonderful name in heaven and on earth is Jesus, okay? I, I get that. He's the most wonderful thing that's ever happened to me. I don't know about you, but he's the most wonderful thing that's ever happened to me. His love is the most wonderful feeling and comfort that I've ever felt. And his message is the greatest, the most wonderful news that I've ever heard, okay? So if I must separate the two, then I'm glad to do that. But I believe that Jesus is wonderful. But if we read them together in Isaiah 9, 6, it says that he shall be called Wonderful Counselor. Have you ever been to a counselor before? Just raise your hand if you have no shame. Have you ever been to a counselor before? 
a bunch of liars. <laughs> yeah, you, you've been, okay. Uh, I've, I've been to several, and you're like, yeah, we knew that. <laughs> uh, I, I got into a scuffle once in the fifth grade. Can you believe that? A fight, a real fight. Yeah, I fought. <laughs> it was with a bunch of boys, so I wasn't alone. But it was something worth fighting for. Playground rights, okay. <laughs> Boy brotherhood, okay. And it was indeed a slugfest. My team won, by the way. Um, but after the fight, of course, we got caught. And we had to go into the counselor's office. <laughs> His name was Mr. Melvin. <laughs> And let me tell you a story about Mr. Melvin. Mr. Melvin was at least eight feet tall. <laughs> okay, big, big guy. And he was over the lunchroom. Every, like, his, his, I think his main job was to give silent lunches during lunchtime. We were being too loud. But he'd get up, like, and I'm serious, this guy was huge. Goliath and him might have been on equal scale. But he gets up during a loud lunch, and he would say, No more talking. And it'd get quiet. And then somebody might make a sound. And he'd go, you talk? <laughs> and I'm like, you didn't talk again. This guy was huge. And, and he, was, he was, now, he was an angry counselor. <laughs> you went to him, you went to him when you were in trouble. And if you were in trouble enough, he'd give you ISS or OSS or silent lunch. In this potential case, we each had a week of silent lunch. We had table washing, and we had a few days after school detention, which wasn't so bad because I got a snack every day, okay, for after school detention. I remember that. They had these little Butterfinger BBs and Dr. Peppers. That's what I had for snack. I can remember, okay, getting in trouble. But this guy, he was an angry counselor. And I, you know what? I've been to angry counselors before, way worse than Mr. Melman. Maybe you have too. And I've been to disconnected counselors before in college, you know, where, where they had a job to do, and you knew that was their job just to advise you. They, they had to do it. They could care less that they were sitting behind the desk. They'd rather be doing something else. You signed up for it. They didn't really have a, you know, a ton of work to do, but they were disconnected from any feeling that you had. I've been with disconnected counselors before. No time for talk. Let's get this over with, okay? And then there are overbearing counselors. You know who they are. They ask a million questions when you just want to answer one. And they want to get into every detail of your life. Even though you haven't given them access to every detail of your life, they're not really, they're trying to be empathetic, but they're really being sympathetic. And then they ask that question, well, how do you feel about that? <laughs> okay, sometimes we get overwhelming counselors. Um, how about Jesus, though? What kind of counselor is he? Isaiah 9, 6 says that he is our wonderful counselor. <laughs> Our wonderful counselor. Uh, 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 the word wonderful, it means this, okay? This is something really new that I learned. It means miracle worker. It means a wonder. Okay, so I want you to look at it this way, okay? Wonderful counselor doesn't just mean that he's delightful or he's pleasing, but it also means he's a miraculous counselor. A wonderful counselor, a wonder-working counselor. It means that the way he counsels is wonder-working. The work of his counsel, miraculous. It means that he is indeed a miracle-working counselor who can, do, uh, who, can, who can do whatever he wants, however he wants, whenever he wants. He will lead you straight. No matter, uh, no matter who it is on the earth, whether their prestige is great or position is great, God is greater in his counsel. He's a wonder-working counselor, infinitely better in his counsel. That means that he, what he has to say is more important than what Dr. Phil has to say. That means what he has to say is more important than what Oprah has to say. That means what he has to say is more important than what Dr. Oz has to say. What he has to say is above any motivational speaker or book or magazine. You read his counsel is perfect in every way. He is a wonder-working counselor. Now listen, I'm not saying that the counselors that you may see or you may go to aren't special people or aren't good people or don't help you out. But don't miss on what I'm trying to get across to you today. It's just that men and women oftentimes are just that, human beings, right? <laughs> human beings. And human beings can lead you astray. Did you know that I'm a counselor too? Did y'all know that? <laughs> yeah, I am. Okay. Uh, and, and, and did you know what? I'm not a perfect counselor. Not even, not even close. Okay. Did you know that sometimes when I counsel, I don't feel up to it? Did you know sometimes I feel that way? Don't act like you've never felt that way. Sometimes, sometimes you just don't feel up to it, right? Sometimes, though, sometimes the quality of advice that I may give you may depend on the day that I've had. <laughs> if I've had a rough day, it might not be a good counseling time. Vice versa, okay? 
Sometimes I get angry when I'm counseling people because I can see the warfare or you can see the sin or you can see the stubbornness in people and you get upset about it. Sometimes I do get disconnected or disengaged or distracted. And did you know that sometimes when I counsel, I don't always have the answer that people want? And sometimes I don't have the solution to the problem. Sometimes I don't I have people leave and their troubles are still there. Their pain is still there. Their circumstances are there. And they have not changed. Why? Because I'm a human being. And that's very unfortunate, right? Okay. But you know what, though? Jesus is our wonderful counselor. And you can be rest assured that, that that's what makes him such a wonderful counselor, that his perspective is infinite, his resources are infinite, uh, his knowledge is infinite, his truth and guidance is unlimited. He's qualified in every way to help you. Okay, his experiences you'll find today are similar to our own circumstances and the help and direction that he gives will point you to him alone. The title, Wonderful Counselor, is like nothing else you've ever seen or heard or experienced before. Now, this would have brought a lot of comfort to the people in Isaiah's day. Because Judah was being subject in the past to some pretty bad um, counsel. They had some kings and they had some rulers and they had some, maybe even some prophets of, of old who, who were not godly in their counsel. They did not seek the Lord. Um, they, did not, they did not understand the truth of God's word. They did not rely on the counsel of God's word. And so when Isaiah promised that this coming Messiah was going to come, the Son of God, Jesus Christ was going to come, this must have brought a lot of hope and comfort because he would surpass kings in their wisdom. He would surpass rulers in their knowledge. He would surpass the most wise of men in their counsel. He would be the answer, the help, the solution to the nation's needs. He would be their wonderful counselor. And so what I want to do today is just give you one way, one description of Jesus' counsel. I'll give you two more tonight. But what's so wonderful about our Lord's counsel? One thing I want to get you today, his counsel, you don't miss this, his counsel is understanding of our circumstances and struggles. I want you to get that. As our wonderful counselor, he is understanding of our circumstances and struggles. That means that he sympathizes and he knows what you're going through. You look at Hebrews chapter 4. I want you to turn there real quick. Hebrews 4. I want you to see this one example of how Jesus is our wonderful counselor. Hebrews chapter 4. Did you know um, for about nearly a year and a half, all of 2015 and most of 2016, we study the book of Hebrews on Wednesday nights and Sunday nights. Study the whole book, okay? That, I preached nearly 65 messages out of this book. All right, so, so we're very familiar, all right, with, with the letter to the Hebrews. And Hebrews was, was a letter written to a group of struggling Jews, okay? Some of them were Christians, some of them knew Jesus, some of them were on fire for the Lord, but they, they, they suffered from the temptation and the struggle to renounce Christ because persecution was getting heavy. And then some of them that he wrote to were unbelievers, and they were facing the decision of whether or not they should follow Christ or give up. And all of them, though, were faced with the reality that Jesus is greater, better than anything or anyone that's ever walked on the face of this earth. Greater than religion, greater than the law, greater than some system or practice, or greater than men of faith, greater than all these things. And in chapter 4, the author is stating here that Jesus is greater than any high priest. And as a matter of fact, Jesus is the great high priest. He's not like Aaron, who could only hope that he did everything right. He's not like Aaron in the, in the hope that he only got the prescriptions right or that he obeyed all the rules and the temple procedures. And he, he can only hope that the people would be temporarily forgiven. Jesus was and is the great high priest who became the sacrifice for our sins himself. And so in Jesus Christ, he is the perfect ministering high priest. That's why he's the most wonderful counselor of all. I want you to look at these verses, Hebrews 4, verses 14 through 16. And you'll see what I mean here when I say that he understands. Look at this, verse 14. It says, seeing that we have such a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. Now look at verse 15. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. 
Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Here it is. He understands. As our counselor, our wonderful counselor, he sympathizes. That means that he knows the pain that you may have on your heart today. That mean, I'll tell you, it always helps, folks. It always helps when you have a counselor who can relate. They know what you're feeling. They sense it. They hurt for you. They're with you. Jesus understands. Can I say that again? Jesus understands. He is our wonderful counselor. So I want to ask you, what difficult circumstance are you facing today? What problem do you have? What hurt do you have? What struggle do you have? What trouble did you come into this building with today? Because I need you to know Jesus, the wonderful counselor, understands fully. We do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize, the word says, with our weaknesses. But he was tempted in every way as we are, yet he did not sin. Instead, he overcome. He understands. That's the story of Christmas, folks. That's the message, okay? That God would find us where we were, that God would meet us, come to us in our desperation, in our hurt, in our pain, in our struggles, and simply say, I understand, I'm with you. He couldn't effectively minister if he didn't understand. He couldn't effectively restore or heal if he could not sympathize or understand. The message of Christmas is not that God stayed up in heaven and just relaxed up there in the heavenlies so far away from us while we struggled in weaknesses and suffering and sin. The message of Christmas is that God came to us and knew and experienced every way of struggle that you've ever faced, every way of sin that you've ever faced. The message of Christmas is that God understood the temptation and the pain and the sting and the defeat and the discouragement and the fear and the doubt. He understood it. That's the message and the beauty of Christmas. That God would come down in your circumstances and live among you and understand. He can sympathize with you. He knows. You want to know why? He knows about suffering. I think we forget that about God. God knows what it's like to suffer. See in Jesus' life. Read Isaiah 53 if you need to see how Jesus suffered on earth. He knew what it was like to suffer. Jesus knew what it was like to face fear or trials or temptations. Read Matthew 4 and read about how Jesus stood toe-to-toe with Satan himself. He understands He knows. He knows what it's like to be weak. Have you ever read Luke chapter 22 where Jesus is in the garden of Gethsemane and his soul is in such anguish, there's so much anxiety and stress that he is sweating drops of blood? That's pretty stressed, isn't it? That's pretty anxious, isn't it? That's a lot of anguish Jesus understands. And you know what? Something that people forget, maybe you've went through this recently, Jesus knows what it's like to face death, and Jesus knows what it's like to die. Read John chapter 19. He understands. So if you've ever been weak, and you came in today, and you're at your breaking point, I want you to know wonderfully today, he's our wonderful counselor. He understands. And and, and if you're under heavy temptation today, or you're in a super spiritual battle today, and struggle today, he understands. He's been there. If you face suffering, or anguish, or maybe you're even facing death itself, he's walked that road too. You're not going through a thing in this life that God has not already went through himself. And here's the truth and the glory of Christmas. He's with us right now in this moment. He's with us right now in your circumstance and your struggle. And he's with you all the time. He can sympathize. He is your wonderful counselor. And how do we overcome You profess his strength over your circumstance. You profess his salvation over your circumstance. You profess his hope over your circumstance. You know something that I've learned in my time, you know, as as a pastor, I've learned that one of the biggest turnoffs to a person who is hurting is to say senseless things like, I know what you're going through. Or I know how that feels. Or I understand. When you've never been in that situation... You can't say that, can you? 
You can't say, I, I, I know how you feel or I understand or I know what that feels like if you've never been in that situation because there's been a lot of times where I've been in a hospital waiting room or, or at a home or at a rest home or at a, at a hospice house or at a funeral and I could not say those words honestly because I had no idea what those people could have been feeling. I've never been in those circumstances. I've never lost a child. I've never had cancer. I've never struggled with substance addiction. I've never lost my wife or went through a nasty divorce. I I've always had both of my parents together, so I can't counsel you and say or know how that feels. But you know what I can say every time? I can say, I know the one who knows how you feel. I know the one who understands your circumstance. I know the one who's with you right now, who's going to help you through that. I can point you to Jesus every time. Amen. Our wonderful counselor. And it's about time today some of you meet that wonderful counselor. You need that spoken into your heart today, that reality today, that Jesus is your counsel. Jesus is your hope. Jesus will be your peace. Jesus will be your joy. And maybe there's someone in the room today that needs to know Jesus will be your Savior. He is our wonderful counselor in the fact that he understands. He knows. Would you bow your heads with me for a moment? Listen, I don't, I don't want to dismiss the fact today that you may have come in here with a burden, with a heartache, with a person, a circumstance, maybe like in our class this morning, you're in a problem that you cannot fix. But I need you to know today that Jesus will. Jesus can. He already did. 2,700 years ago when Isaiah spoke Christ and said, he's coming. He's already here, folks. <laughs> he already has come. He already has paid the price for your sins. He already has paid the price for your struggles. He has already walked the road that you are on. Truly, he understands. So maybe today, with heads bowed and eyes closed, maybe today you simply just need to respond to the powerful word of God. Let him understand with you. You know, we can do a lot of things. We can go to counselors and we can talk to other people and friends and we talk to family about what we're going through. But the best thing we can do today is to offer up those struggles, those heartaches, those circumstances, offer them up to our holy and perfect and wonderful counselor and let him minister to your heart. So if you need to come today and just pray let the Lord deal with your heart and give him whatever's on your mind or heart. I encourage you to come. Robbie, if you would just play a stanza of a song. I want to give people an opportunity to respond to the message of Jesus being your wonderful counselor. He understands. He knows what you're going through so well that he bore it, he died for it, he paid for it, he sympathizes, he knows. So would you come today in obedience if God's just dealing with your heart today? I want you to be obedient. You come if you need to. You respond as God leads. You come.